Uh, okay, so good evening everyone. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land of which we are on and pay my respects to all elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to thank you all for joining myself and the Garden History Society tonight to join in on Stuart's webinar with Avenues of Honour. Uh, this is the first time that we've actually held anything like this for the Sydney and Northern New South Wales branch. And uh, hopefully if all goes well, we might make it a regular thing. Uh, I just wanted to all let, let you know that we are recording tonight's talk as well, uh, so that others who may not be able to bit, uh, join tonight can see it afterwards. So if anyone doesn't agree to this, uh, you might just have to di disable your camera or change your name if, if any of that's necessary. Um, I'm sure you all know Stuart and I know that's what's brought you here tonight. Uh, Stuart wears a multitude of different hats and as most of you would know that one of those hats is the AGHS co-chair alongside Bronner and Blake. I've heard Stuart mentioned as an opinionated so-and-so and also having a high curiosity index which I think fits him pretty perfectly. For his day job, Stuart is a Senior Heritage Operations Officer for the New South Wales Department of Premier and Cabinet. There he prepares nominations for state heritage listings and Aboriginal placemaking, provides advice on site management, grants, education and training for advisors, planners and developers. He also advises on adaptive reuse, managing change and giving heritage a viable, productive economic future. He is a renowned expert in landscape heritage and garden history and also collaboratively, work, collaboratively working in urban design, landscape planning with a passion for landscape design, horticulture, plants and botany. So if you join me in digitally work, welcoming Stuart <coughs> Reid and avenues of honour. I just wanted to uh, quickly go through some housekeeping before we begin though. So if everyone could just uh, keep uh, themselves muted during the webinar. This will make it easier for web, uh, for Stuart to maintain um, his talk and also means everyone will be able to hear him more clearly without interruptions. Uh, and also, if you have any questions, please keep them till the end of the presentation when Stuart will... I'd have to do it already. So, well, everybody, welcome, Stuart. Do we applause? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. I'll just so. share my screen. So hopefully in a minute or so, you'll be able to see. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Let's get cracking. I'm um, not good at numbers and you can read faster than I can talk. So I won't be stressing the dates and the there's a lot of numbers in this talk. <coughs> The juiciest and most frightening numbers are on this slide here. And the point is really, this was massive in its impact on a small population and the smaller the town or the smaller the district, the bigger the impact. One boy who doesn't come home to a country town or three boys and one family who are wiped out or you know, a girl who's a nurse who's killed, <coughs> leaves a big impact in a small place. And it was one in five, 60,000 Australians, 18,000 Kiwis, and this is an Anzac talk, so there's a bit of a Kiwi moment in here too. But just imagine what kind of reception that had. I mean, we're having <laughs> one of these impact things now with daily broadcasts of numbers of deaths and, you know, scares. You know, I'm not going out in Potts Point today because there's two outbreaks of virus just up the road. Damn. So welcome to the, where we are. Somebody's not muted. Please mute yourself. Find the button that's down the bottom. Or do we have to mute this one? Otherwise, I can't think and you'll get a less exciting talk. Um, the other thing to remember is that Australia was extremely divided about going to war. We weren't all rampant nationalists in 1914 and we didn't all wish to fight somebody else's war on somebody else's country about somebody else's issue. And that nearly split the country in two, conscription. But we went. This image I've stolen, it's, it's off a, an advertising hoarding, which used to be around the Anzac Memorial in Hyde Park. Uh, we were such cheapskates and spent so much on marble and granite building the monument that we never finished the proper design. And the proper design included a cascade, a fountain at the back, a water cascade, which has finally been built. And when it was being uh -huh. built, yeah. Penny, can you please find your mute button and mute that? 
when it was fin- when it was finally built, there were hoardings around the building site, and this was on one of the hoardings. I love this because it's obviously some boys on the on the battlefront in France or near Belgium, dreaming of home, and and home happened to be circular key. So that's in <laughs> a delicious picture. You can read that faster than I can say it, but I guess the point is, somebody killed on a foreign battlefield. Uh, Back in those days, we didn't have Hercules airports, uh, air, aircraft, and we didn't have body bags. No bodies came back, and there was nothing for a, a family that was grieving, a girlfriend, a wife, a mother, uh, to, to grieve over. It's a bit like when the fetus is taken away in a hospital and a baby is not born, and you don't get to see what it might have been. And that, that awful thing to have to somehow imagine and uh, commemorate a, a death without any physical thing. So the tree and, and a tree or a grouping of trees became that thing. It became something to focus on, something local, something commemorative. And uh, that was a very poignant thing. John Dargavell down the bottom is a uh, quite renowned forestry historian in Australia. And he's written rather uh, beautiful stuff about trees amongst others. This is not her best photo, but you'll see this name, Sarah Wood, quite a bit in this talk. Sarah is uh, the granddaughter of an Australian general, and she's also a great photographer. And I'm not, I'm not doing her credit with this image, but you'll see some lovely images of hers later. And she's taken photographs of Victorian, she lives in Victoria, Avenues of Honour, um, and made an exhibition which has toured the country. It's also toured, I gather, parts of France, which is wonderful, really. Um, so just, just to mention her and uh, keep an eye out for that name. Uh, the trigger for, for me and for Garden History taking this project on was really started by a different group called TreeNet. And TreeNet, down the bottom you can see it's a not-for-profit and it's a, a group of like-minded people who are arborists or uh, nursery people or council people, people who deal with trees in their daily lives, usually professionally, uh, and some of them had a real bee in their bonnet about World War I and about grandparents and memorial avenues of honour. So they started this project before 2014 because uh, we've just celebrated a number of 100 year anniversaries of the First World War, of it beginning and of it ending. And uh, they were determined to map and to document all Australia's avenues before that. Uh, and where possible, um, conserve them or better still, re- reinstate them, replant and start new ones, uh, noting those anniversaries. And I thought that was a terrific project and <laughs> started talking to Trina and also mirroring it. So they, they have, um, they've now changed their naming a little bit and they call them Living Memorials, which I think is a good name. It covers a number of uh, bases and you'll see naming gets a bit tricky. And this slide, uh, AGHS and, and myself took a different approach. TreeNet actually combine all of those different wars as of course we keep going to war but you know where do you start as in New Zealand for example there's the Maori wars in the 1860s in Sudan and, and uh, Crimea and <laughs> the Boer war in South Africa before we've even got to 1900 so you know there are other wars and there's of course there's the world wars of one and two but we're still doing it Korea Vietnam Af- Iraq Afghanistan at the moment in the Middle East it, it's a very profitable business and you might well wonder about the motivations behind war, but um, you know, what, what, what gets counted and what doesn't? Is it just about World War I and II or is it all these other? I took the, the notion that it should be all wars and it should be all trees, not just avenues, but down the bottom you start <laughs> quickly discovering uh, inconsistencies or other varieties. For example, the lone pine stuff. That means nothing to a European, but it means plenty to an Anzac uh, person in New Zealand or here, because Turkey was an absolute slaughterhouse for, for our troops and our nurses, and not a good look, and uh, it really hit to the bone, that, that battle. So even if that's commemorated in one tree, they should be counted, and they're quite important. But you'll also quickly come across other avenues and other trees. We've, we've been planting avenues forever and in every culture, <laughs> particularly Europe. Uh, and not just for war, you know, the Queen visits Australia and, you know, might plant an avenue or <laughs> Highway 66 in the United States, you know, it's not a, a new form of planting, but 
the reason you do it is, is really highly variable. So we're trying to cover all these bases, and including non-warm oil avenues that are creeping in <laughs> a little. At the moment, and this is a bit fluid, but this is a snapshot of right now, these numbers. Uh, we've only come up with five uh, avenues to the Boer War. There's plenty of granite or marble, you know, or soldier statues, other forms of memorial for the Boer War, but not avenues of trees, so there's five. At the moment, counting New Zealand and Australia, there's 452 to the First World War, 99 to the Second, 255 to other and later wars, uh, which makes a total, I'm not great at maths, but I think it's about 800. Not bad for a small country, and that's quite astounding to the Europeans. I mean, this was an idea planting in War Memorial Avenue. It was an English idea that uh, the English didn't really take to. It's typical kind of lukewarmness. They had the idea and then exported it and, and bickered and argued and didn't plant any. But the colonies did. Canada did. The United States did. We certainly did in quantity. Even down the bottom. I mean, I'm not talking about Lone Pine so much, but there's 124 between two little countries, which is quite tells you something about the impact of Gallipoli. But really the point is the last paragraph there. That thanks to Trinet and thanks to people waking up about this and, um, and governments too, there's been quite a lot of funding floating around and quite a lot of positive uh, replanting and replaking, re-signing uh, conservation really uh, and, and renewal of avenues in the last four or five years. And that's a terrific thing really. And, and AGHS can take some credit for that. Uh, it's really about just raising people's awareness. So when did we start? At, at least, I mean, avenues of honour, going back, uh, what I call, or what we call, World War I, see that? And then Memorial Avenues, World War II. So this talk is really just about World War I and avenues of honour. So in terms of when they started, they started during the war. Uh, you would know well some of the avenues in this talk, like Ballarat, they were later. They were 1917, I think, but two years earlier, typically South Australia did it first. <laughs> but again, this is on current information. So I'd love to hear about, you know, an, an earlier one or a different one in a different state. It could well be. Uh, but so far, uh, it seemed to happen first in the Adelaide Hills. And again, this is probably about small communities and one boy who gets killed. And news gets home and people get upset and stuff happens. Victoria were hot on the heels and their education department was hugely influential in this. They offered free trees to your school. Uh, and just think about that, you know, a network of schools right across the state. And also an older tradition of Arbor Day. You have probably heard about Arbor Day. It was an American idea. And again, taken up with a lot of vigor here. Uh, and it was an opportunity once, once a year at the right season to plant a tree or plant trees and schools, so put those two things together, uh, and free trees, you know, delivered by train to your local train station, and you get a lot of trees happening, which is probably why Victoria has the most avenues of any state. Uh, it certainly had a lot of population, but not necessarily more than this state did, but it has a lot of trees, and you can see a few dates there for the first ones. But soon after, New South Wales, and I'll show you that in a minute, Yumundi in Queensland and Tasmania, hot on the hills, still during the war, 1917, and actually not Canberra, but Hall, which is a little town outside Canberra on the outskirts, technically in New South Wales, uh, and also Kings Park in Perth, just after the war, 1919. So they started during the war. That's interesting. In terms of the state we're in, here's the oldest I've found so far. So during the war, 1916, Lauriton, which is on the north coast. And it's interesting, it's not one species. It's, it's a mixture, it's two, in fact, it's yeah, two, two, two species, uh, Norfolk Island pine, and what's now the dreaded camp laurel. At the time, it wasn't dreaded at all. At the time, it was high fashion and a good shade tree for country roads. The Department of Main Roads used to promote camp laurels for good shade. And, you know, we, we've learned that the comes comes with a sting. It's also an X. It's not an avenue. It's two avenues that cross in the middle of town, which is really interesting. But notice that, and then notice this. One of my favourite, favourite words is the word digitise. And, and uh, hopefully you, you know about Trove and you know about the National Library, but other, uh, you know, historical societies are slowly digitising their collections of photos. So here we have, and, and notice the handwritten 
showing trees planted in memory of our soldier boys, written by some local photographer, and the tree boxes. <laughs> and it took a bit of imagination at the start because you had to create this thing and then look at it without, <laughs> without much of an avenue for the first 10 years or so. But here's Lorrington going in and later. Not a bad look. Somebody please turn off their exciting music and find their mute button. That'd be good. Here we are in the rather gorgeous valley of the upper Murray River. This bit is wriggling through Victoria, but it wriggles through New South Wales as well. Uh, Kajiwar. And this is a bit early for colour, but you can see the colour coming. This is a, an avenue and a little town uh, put in by... Uh, it stops, it goes down the main street and stops at a, at a farm gate. And that farm belonged to a woman and it was planted by school children. And those two uh, ingredients are quite, uh, what do you say, symptomatic of avenue planting. It happened through women, it happened through community groups, particularly schools, but also community groups. Uh, and it's interesting what they chose to plant too. It's oaks and it's elms, but it's not typical oaks and it's certainly not European, it's Iranian oak. Persian, if you like, and American oak, <laughs> and it's Dutch as well as English, quote unquote English, but actually European elm. Good choices for that climate. It's high and it's cool in winter. Fine thing. Here we are in small town Victoria, which again, a bit like Loriton, uh, and the, during the war, and this is one for each war. <laughs> There's the plaque for World War One, and you're looking at the World War One Avenue of Oaks, uh, of elms, pardon. But they did the same thing again in the small town for World War II. Uh, and that's that's pretty good effort for a small town. The axe, not exactly enormous. But we use native trees. Here's, here's the Norfolk Island pine gracing the waterfront at uh, Victor Harbour, not Adelaide, but down the coast. Uh, and down the bottom, see that digitised photo? This is, again, the State Library of uh, South Australia are digitising their photo collection. Terrific stuff. So here it is. You know, nice and fresh and sort of five to ten years old with rustic <laughs> uh, garden uh, decoration as well. So photographs are very helpful to work out uh, planting dates and also success or failure. Some, some didn't do well and some species weren't chosen well or there was no follow-up, no maintenance. Terrific. But notice uh, <laughs> donation box for the gardens. <laughs> Paying for these things was tricky. And uh, sometimes the community were impatient to get some action and couldn't be bothered waiting for governments of any level to get around to coming up with the funding. Uh, so they, they worked it out themselves. I love this photo and you might have seen this in the Oxford Companion. This is Hobart and it's the domain. So to the left of that view is the city of Hobart and to the right is Government House eventually. And this is an avenue not to the war but to the king, a triple avenue marching up the hill. But if you look carefully, you can see an obelisk, right? Just sort of lower middle of the screen. And you can see a line crossing the screen horizontally. That is a crisscrossing World War I avenue of cedars put in just during the end and, and after the war. Uh, and it didn't do terribly well, there was very little follow up. Here's the tail end of it at the other end of, it wraps around the domain. And here it is, some trees did well, some did not. But notice that other date, 1999, which is when they replanted. So you can see some little tiny blobs of baby cedars going back in. And you can't see that plaque very well, but it's got terrific plaques. And this is interesting that um, people get a bit passionate about this stuff and, and about family history, because this is all about families and all about communities. Uh, each of these plaques now has a little story about that boy or that girl who didn't come home where they were from, their family, you know, their rank, not just their squadron and where they were killed. A little story, a terrific amount of work to get that stuff together for a plaque, but uh, well worth a look if you're in Hobart. Okay, just at the end of the war, here we are on the edge of Tamworth and uh, on, the, on the main highway, the New England highway. Six blocks, not small, and this is one suburb of Tamworth, not, not the whole city. A mixed species, again, and interesting. Notice the female thread through here and the soldiers' mothers, but not just that, the West Tamworth Girls Club, <laughs> the Women War Workers Association, wah, 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 wah. Uh, women play a big role in this. And, and it's, that's unsurprising, I suppose, because uh, you know, they're, they're openly grieving, I guess, but uh, terrific kind of social history behind some of these avenues.
when you scratch a bit. I'm sure you've seen this photo and I'm sure people know or perhaps have driven down bits of the Ballarat Avenue of Honour. It's a cracker. You can't see it from outer space, but it's probably the nearest Australia gets to something you could see from outer space in terms of avenues, 22 kilometres, goes to the next town. And um, it has a big triumphal arch at the end. Isn't that nice? <laughs> but uh, again, women, notice the, the kind of backdrop here. Lucas Girls is a lingerie factory, it's a small clothing factory in ba Ballarat, and it was run by a woman called Lucas, and she mostly employed women, young, young girls and women, and of course, they were girlfriends of, wives of, sisters, cousins of, boys at war, and they were uh, quite taken by this idea, and couldn't be bothered waiting for the men, couldn't be bothered waiting for the army, so they got on with it, and uh, got cracking. <laughs> Terrific piece of work. Mm. And this is a dodgy map, but uh, it shows you how, how big it is. The, the dotted line is the, what they call the Western Freeway, which now bypasses Ballarat, used to go down the main street. You know, that'll play a, a role at the end of this talk. You'll see another photo of that. But it goes through Ballarat and out to the next town, Learmont in the north, where there's a cross of remembrance and a tributary. Little, again, a historic photo with a plaque on a, on a tree box. I've pinched these photos. They're not very good scans, I'm sorry, but. They're from a, a plan of management, and I think that plan of management is on, online. Terrific. So again, a community a bit nervous about an ageing avenue, wanting to renew it, wanting to look after it better. So studying, what have they got? And look at those lists of trees. It's, it's all sorts of trees. I read somewhere today that um, poplars were very popular because they represented France. And they, mm. if, you, if your boy fell on a French battlefield, you know, let's plant poplars. Ditto elms, the choice of tree sometimes was very symbolic of the country where battle may have happened or not. You know, some of these are more to do with climate or more to do with drought or dry hardiness. And it's interesting to see which of these mixture of trees did okay and which did not. And you know, when you come to replant, should you <laughs> replant like for like or actually should you move on if something's failed and you know, the climate's getting harder and the droughts are getting longer? and be a bit practical about what will actually cope in that location. But there is a plan of management, which I'm delighted to report. But again, here's a native tree, one of the small leafed figs, uh, what's called Hill's fig. Walter Hill ran the Brisbane Botanic Gardens. Uh, and you'll know this fig from streets that are too small for it, but here it is with a bit of space, doing its best in uh, suburban que uh, Queensland, Yamundi, uh, outskirts of Brisbane with plaques, uh, but using a rainforest tree and terrific shade tree, if they've got enough space and you know, they're not in the way of <laughs> trucks and wires and all the rest of it. Nice to see that. High country Victoria, Corion, almost to the Murray, not quite, uh, during the war. And again, using cedars, using the Himalayan and the Atlas, the Moroccan cedar and pin oaks on the main street. Fine thing and in very good condition you know, and a good choice of, of species. You know, they come from the mountains, those trees, and there they are in the mountains. Here's a much better photo of Sarah's uh, of Woodend, uh, a lovely avenue of, of oaks. But again, interesting mixture of oaks, not just the English or the European, but the Algerian oak, which is a far better oak for warm, dry Australia. It's certainly a much better oak for our future than uh, you know, the more thirsty European oak is. They're used to drought and they do marvellously well, but this just happens to be spring and bud burst, so they're looking particularly joyous. But again, you know, it's not a big town, Wood End, two and a half kilometres long. <laughs> Quite a good thing for a small community to organise. Another one of Sarah's, and again, this is interesting. They planted something native, they used uh, mahogany gums uh, and they failed. So Rather than repeat a mistake, they, they switched and used elms, and not the English, but the Scottish elm, which is even tougher, even hardier. Uh, must be a bit of a frost hollow drummond. But notice the sign on the edge of the road, and that's another one of tree nets and, and Sarah's photos. And notice the little shrine, well, shrine, what would you call it? Little uh, commemorative plaque and, and kind of a bus stop <laughs> down the bottom. <laughs> uh, quite good interpretation. Robin, these are Robin's photos, and thanks for <laughs> listening in, Robin. Here we are in the Blue Mountains, uh, doing it through a council and through a community group, but doing it over a few years. Notice those dates, it was dedicated, but it wasn't finished for another couple of years. By the time they'd got the money together and built the, the, the monumental arch at the other end of the avenue, 
it was 1920, but it started before that. And it wasn't one species. And you could say it's not an avenue, it's a mixture, or it's a grove. I'm not sure how you describe this one. But it happened and it's still there. And even more pleasing, it's got, <laughs> you know, uh, signage at both ends. So it's a bit hard to miss if you're looking. This, um, Chris Bettridge got me quite a few photos for this talk. And this is, here we are out on the plains in Western Victoria, the dry country. So an Algerian oak would do well, but so would a Californian pine. And this is the great uh, Monterey pine, or radiata, as people prefer to call it, doing its best in hot, dry Western Victoria. And notice the concrete, very practical use of uh, <laughs> a material that's fairly hard to destroy. Uh, for the plaques under the trees. I think they might have replaced some of these, but uh, they're still there in quantity. Good choice for that climate after the war. Perth, uh, I'm sure people know Kings Park, which uh, is a botanic garden and also a park. It's huge and you access it by car. So it has a number of drives, if you like scenic drives along the ridges, really lovely. Uh, this one was, um, Ludkin was the main, he was a Member of Parliament for Western Australia, and he was a, a newspaper owner, magnate, publisher, and also proponent of uh, commemorative plantings. He was really a champion, if you like. This was named for him, this drive. Originally, it was oaks and plains, and they failed. And it's on a sand hill. Uh, most of Perth is on sand country. This is on a sand hill. Oaks don't particularly like dry sand and perfect drainage. and <laughs> like a bit more moisture, thanks. So they didn't do very well. So they replanted with, with Bangalore, good choice. And here they are. Um, so it's, you could say it's a 1945 planting for a 1917 war, but uh, you know, the original planting was 1916-17 was with plaques under them. Again, dry country, but western, southwestern uh, New South Wales. Here we are using the Chilean pepper tree on the main street of um, Arellum. And I read today that uh, thanks that there's claims that cotton spraying and chemicals are defoliating the, the pepper trees of the southern Riverina. You know, it's all the fault of cotton growers, but it turns out to be all the fault of drought, actually. <laughs> There's only so much drought a pepper tree can take before it drops its leaves. Mm. But they're tough old birds, and sometimes they're the only trees you'll see in that climate, or maybe the only shade that are stock, you know, a sheep that have been shorn or whatever, in, in stockyards uh, and market uh, squares, that sort of thing. So a, good, a very good choice, you know, a Chilean tree in that climate. I particularly love this. I'm not showing you much Queensland, but here's a ripper down the main street of Roma. Uh, bottle trees, and what a good choice. You know, these are youngsters. You know, <laughs> they, they'll put on some speed and fatten up with time and look like Chianti bottle, but at the moment you can just see the a little bit pregnant, you might say. But an excellent choice, because again, dry rainforest tree, uh, variable, to put it nicely, climate. I've not been to Roma, but I've heard that one of these bottles is much bigger than the others. And it's just in front of the public toilet block, and it's probably on top of a broken sewer pipe. <laughs> I particularly like that. I don't know which uh, soldier got that one to his name, but he chose the right tree. But that's a very Australian, you know, there are very few countries in the world who show you an avenue like that. More commonly, you'd see something like this, sugar gums, which is a South Australian tree, but uh, widely planted along roads, especially in West WA, South Australia, Queensland, dry New South Wales. And it's been pollarded. It looks rather European. It's been butchered, if you like, and come back. These gums will take a lot of pruning. We're very coy about pruning gums. We should not be. They'll take all manner of pummeling. Uh, but again, notice the sign and notice the treatment and, and um, Chris Betridge to thank for this, but also notice planted by school children. There's that theme again. This one is on my cover, but it's also hopefully known to you Northerners very well. This is Gostwick, and it's uh, really poignant because this is one, uh, an, a triple avenue, a Y-shaped confluence of three avenues that meet at that little chapel in the middle down the bottom. And it's by one family, the Dangers, who are farmers and major landowners and also land surveyors, so pick the best bits of land for the family, uh, outside Yurala, but to one boy who was supposed to come home and supposed to inherit that farm and never came home. So again, you can just imagine how uh, decimated that family would be. An absolute knockout in autumn, so <laughs> it was pretty knockout in spring. Here we are having a conference and uh, Stuart wandering up there in spring. But imagine that butter yellow 
not a bad memory uh, for a boy. And again, a rather delicious, thank you, John Taylor, a rather delicious Queensland picture of a mango avenue. <laughs> almost 1,800 trees. After the war, this is the middle of the 20s, over 18 kilometres, not quite a Ballarat, but not a bad effort, uh, named for the Anzacs. And even notice the suburb name, Mango Hill. Isn't that delicious? I think that's a cracker, and I was very thrilled to get a photo of that. And you notice they're coming into flower too. So I'm sure the road planners hate that. And, you know, there's squashed mangoes in season and so on, but you know, a fine and an appropriate mem uh, memorial. These are not avenues, but I wanted to put some palms in. This is Albury and Dean Street, the main drag of Albury, from what they call Monument Hill, which is at the western end of Dean Street and Upper Hill. And you climb a zigzag path to get up to the monument. That's the monument at the top on the mm -hmm. left and looking back to town but through palms. And these are uh, Californian desert fan palms and also Canary Island date palms. And on the right, this is Burwood, suburban Burwood Park in Sydney, using that, again, that Canary Island palm. There's a lot of um, social, what would you say, folklore about palms being brought back from the Middle East in boys' pockets and quite possibly this happened. Seed coming back and palms being planted at the War Memorial. Some of it's documented, some of it's not. And again, palms have had a long and a rich planting history in this country and in every country. You know, that, if you think about it, a Persian rug near you or you know, Nebuchadnezzar and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, Christianity and Palm Sunday, you know, the, there are absolute permutations and symbolism to that plant going into most cultures back for millennia. So why wouldn't it be adopted for <laughs> a symbol of life or a symbol of eternal life or life after death? It would and it was. So here it is in two instances. It's not the greatest of scans and it's not my photograph. I wish it were. This is John Gollings doing a wonderful series of uh, drone or airplane shots of, Vic of Melbourne's parks. But this is the Shrine of Remembrance and the, the, the cluster of trees beyond is the Botanic Gardens and this is St Kilda Road doing a bend around the shrine. Just ignore all of that and notice the straight line through the middle. And what it goes through is the Shrine of Remembrance, which is Melbourne's equivalent of Sydney's Anzac Memorial, plus underground entries and things now. It's got a lot bigger than it was. But notice the line, and that line is marked by replanted uh, Bhutan Cypress, which uh, will get a lot bigger. These are, these are youngsters, and they're just down the bottom. I've given you a recent photo of how big they are now. They'll get, you know, four, five, six times the size of that, but very good choice of tree, a very formal shape. If you go to the Southern Highlands, this is a dominant um, hedge species, Bhutan cypress. You know, a fine choice and, and a fine photograph. Of, you, you're meant to see that shrine coming down St, St, St Kilda Road and the eye runs up, up the avenue to the shrine. Here's Sydney's equivalent, which is not quite as grand, I'm sorry, and rather overshadowed <laughs> by buildings but it still you know, has a certain presence of its own. This is an AGHS visit in 20, well, it was before they replaced them. It must have been 2016, I think. It used to have white poplars and upright poplars and they lasted since the 30s, uh, but were not they're on the last legs. They were replaced with tulip trees, but, but upright, fastigiate means upright tulip trees. So you'll get much the same sort of uh, vertical form in time. They'll, they'll make walls and it, it's quite a sombre but very appropriate uh, sort of a space uh, and a lovely space. Kings Park again and a different avenue. This is Fraser Avenue, not um, Lovekin Drive. But, uh, and again, this was not originally planted as a war memorial. This was planted for beautification and it was planted with red flowering gum, the great uh, you know, tree of Western Australia, which failed. On a, on a sand hill, not happy Jan. They'd prefer a, a, a squidgy, squelchy paddock to a dry sand dune. So they failed and they were replanted with uh, a Queensland tree, lemon scented gum, which did particularly well for 30 years and then were dedicated as a war memorial. So they've got a plaque under each tree now, but it was not planted with that in mind. It was planted for beautification. It's a knockout of an avenue. It's also one of the main entries to Kings Park. So. Isn't it grand? I've arrived. Wow, what a place. Uh, 
And then you start to notice that the place means something, or <laughs> there's a bit more going on. There's a War Memorial obelisk at the end of this avenue too. Like anything to do with trees, uh, avenues have issues, right? And some issues are particularly Australian. Termites are not a problem in Europe. They are here. Bushfire, of course, we're a bit aware of that after last January's caning. And grass fires are a bit of an issue here. So here's some oaks up, up a volcano, Mount Macedon, Victoria, that have uh, marked both wars and copped just about everything, including Black Saturday, uh, Ash Wednesday and, and Black Saturday. So they've had quite a hounding, but they're still going. <laughs> They're, they're, they're to both wars, and this is interesting, one avenue serving two wars. And you'll notice, you know, in the notes, they've, termites have had a go. They're still there, and, and the, the community love this and put it back, <laughs> no matter what happens. So that tells you something, doesn't it? Uh, it will happen with trees. Really dodgy photo, apologies. Uh, this is probably a temporary photo. This is Mortlake, uh, Western <laughs> Somebody's not got their mute on. Please find your mute button. Um, Mortlake and using the great cypress of California, the Monterey cypress, or what Kiwis call Macrocarpa, which is the dominant shelter belt tree on the Western Plains, uh, takes the dry, but it also is dying out thanks to a fungus, thanks to canker. Cypress canker is wiping out cypresses across the plains, and that's a, a disaster for single issue, single species shelter belts or avenues. Plus, they're a bit brittle. They grow rather quickly and drop limbs, which is why they've been pruned into buckets. And you might say how ugly, how, you know, how unnatural. It's, it's also practical. It means the highway, which is you know, in use every day, is not blocked. Traffic can flow and you, know, you still get the tree and the effect without the drama. But what to replant? The council's been get, copping a bit of flack lately about <laughs> some coming down and some having to come down. But what do you do? Do you wipe it all out at once and stick it all back in at once? And you get major flack from the public doing that. Or do you do it bit by bit or one by one? And that's not very effective where the, uh, the avenue relies uh, on the effect of uniformity. And so doing things in blocks is better than or all at once or in blocks slowly over two or three years is better than spotty or you know different ages. Sometimes uh, they turn into sculptures, and this has become a, <laughs> another growing sub theme is uh, there's nothing alive in this avenue except the sculptures, but that's actually quite a good outcome. And some of the sculptures are pretty dubious ar artistically, but that's not the point. They're, they're poignant, and I particularly love this sign down the bottom. These sculptures mean something, so please treat them with respect. Uh, but there's, there's a bit of a growing uh, legacy of, of carved avenues of honour now. <laughs> Tasmania's got one or two. Here we are in Victoria. Uh, with new trees, that's even more pleasing. So we've got stumps, but uh, we've also got youngsters coming on too. But you have to think ahead and you have to start planning and you have to start replanting because sooner or later they'll start dying. And of course, we love the car and we love fat cars. Our cars get ever bigger and ever faster. And it's never our fault that we crash into a tree. It's always the tree's fault. <laughs> the fact that we were speeding or we've had a bit too much to drink is really the tree's fault. So the spacing and uh, you know, shifting away trees away from traffic. You know, yes, we'll replant, but we'll replant wider. It means you don't get the effect of a tunnel down the road, but it means you do get uh, safe tra traffic. Uh, and that you do get your avenue back. So at what spacing is, is one of the key issues and how do you manage? Here we are again, a tree, I'm happy to quote from a tree management plan for the King's Highway in, in Braidwood, which is not an honour avenue, but uh, it honours a king and the same issue, speeding, road deaths, you know, safety, uh, but again, strong community attachment. So what do you replant and, and when <laughs> and where? So here we are playing with the where and what those distances are. But also uh, another thing is plaques. Plaques go missing, plaques get pinched, plaques turn up in the local historical museum, but they're not where they should be under the tree or they're on the family's uh, you know, lounge room wall at home. Often, the opportunity to replant is an opportunity to tell more of the story to a generation who didn't go to war, who've never experienced war, who don't understand. So here's a plaque with a bit too much information on it, but good on them, they bunged it in. So there's no, nobody missing off this plaque. <laughs> you could say that's a case of a bit 
overkill, but uh, it's good. It's better than having just, you know, it was opened by the mayor on day X, you know, full stop, and two hour boys, full stop. Um, this is not an avenue of honour, but it's just to make the point that we're in this age where a lot of them are dying or are ailing and need, need some help. So here's a, a, an avenue going back into Parramatta's, Parramatta Park of Oaks, uh, and we need to see that happening with our honour avenues. When you fly in, should you be allowed again to fly in or out of Melbourne, you track over Mickleham, and here's a replanted avenue of honour at Mickleham. And pleasingly, uh, the sugar gums uh, and the river reds, the sugar gums didn't do very well here, the river reds did, so they replanted using river reds. And notice the mix, veterans plus children, very dangerous combination and very sensible because you know you're recruiting another generation <laughs> who understand about grandpa grandpa and the war uh, pleasing to see uh, it happens and it usually happens because of this sort of thing there's something in the local rag here we are looking at the Murrabool news and here's people doing stuff with the mayor you know we've got a petition we want x to happen we want you to spend some of your budget on something we think matters and that's how this happened from the start uh, so really the point of having a list, an AGHS having list online, is exactly this. We need stuff to happen, we need people to be aware, and hopefully they'll do something with that information. Uh, I'm cheating a little here. Here we are having uh, a where shall I put the caravan, darling, we're five minutes from the beach moment, in a, in a uh, coastal holiday park up the, <laughs> uh, near Brunswick Heads using native colitis, native cypress pine, a very good species uh, to choose. Why, why would you bother with a European cypress, as good as they are, when you've got your own from Australia? And on the right, I've slipped in a couple from Sydney Botanic Gardens because they're just lovely trees and you can't see the foliage on the left. But that was actually a war memorial. There's no plaques, there's no sign. You know, the people running the motor camp didn't know uh, and the locals weren't happy. But on the other hand, the local economy depends on tourism and uh, Caravans are a big part of that. So where do they go? And why can't they have the shade under the trees if people don't understand if it's not explained? So that was a bit of a fight. This is, I particularly like this, a dodgy scan, but uh, honk for trees. And we're outside the Prime Minister's office. This is when I think John Howard was the Prime Minister. Well, no, it was Malcolm Turnbull. This is, this is Edgecliff, it's Malcolm Turnbull's office. And uh, what it was really about was what got called Shame Parade, Anzac. Uh, parade through Moor Park. It wasn't planted as a war memorial, but it was dedicated later as a war memorial. It was planted in the 1860s, 1880s. But along comes the war and it was it is an obelisk. The obelisk has been moved because we need another lane of traffic. Here the figs were being moved because we need a, need a tram. Having dug up the trams the first time, they were putting them back. <laughs> they couldn't possibly go around the avenue, they have to go through it. Anyway, shame parade liked that. And there were people camped out here for weeks and weeks protesting about this. So quite a genuine thing. And if nothing else tonight, remember this. I love this. Ankle biters plan to bring council to its knees. And here's the little darlings from a, <laughs> a childcare centre in, uh, in Waverley. And this smiling woman is the uh, assassin who's the Lord Mayor who was about to cut down their paper barks for asset management reasons. And they're council owned facility which is a childcare centre it's not a war memorial but just imagine when these little nippers start growing up and paying rates and tax and perhaps even voting now here they are at it at age you know five i love that so watch out australia as long as we've got kids like that i'm quite happy to be living here and i showed you uh, the dotted line around ballarat right early on here we are uh, uh, replanting a section of Ballarat Avenue. Again, thank you to Chris Betridge, it's his Volvo. And I really love this. This is the Vic Roads who shall not be crossed, but they have been crossed. In fact, they've been undercut here, thanks to, no doubt, a bit of uh, local agitation by <laughs> perhaps descendants of the Lucas girls, I don't know. But here's East-West Link, you know, saving you two minutes between Adelaide and, and uh, Melbourne by bypassing Ballarat undercut and replanted with you know what for you know what and opened by all the smiling politicians who I'm sure were <laughs> hounded to death to make sure that that happened. Jolly good thing. It happens through things like this and this is really my interest is having this list, having it online, having people aware and having links 
So you can look up TreeNet, having links there, you can look up Trove, and think about your town or, you know, uh, find out this stuff. And some of that is paying off. Here's some, here's some good news about avenues from recently, uh, and a lot of it from Victoria. I'm pleased to say that State Government Her uh, Heritage Victoria uh, doing, I think they're finishing now, a survey of their avenues to come up with a sort of a top 10 or to list some of them, uh, and you can probably guess a few of the which some on the State Heritage Register. Jolly good idea and way out ahead of the pack, I have to say. I wish that was happening in New South Wales. It's not. And not just the government, but the National Trust, a community group, are nominating all, not just the best, but all the Victorian avenues. And that's something like 200, there's 190 or something like that all of those, one, World War II, et cetera, to their significant tree register, which is not statutory protection. It doesn't mean they're protected, but it does mean that it's harder to knock them down because you can point to that. You can take that to your council meeting uh, and to your childcare centre and agitate that because a community group who's got some expertise and some knowledge think this is valuable. A terrific precedent. So uh, again, it'd be lovely to see that happening right around the country. And in Tasmania, the friends of, they call them soldiers for Memorial Avenue. So these names are a bit tricky and they're a bit regional. But anyway, the friends of group did a terrific online kit, you know, how for communities, how do I fix up our Avenue of Honour? Where do I get a grant? You know, who can help me here? Uh, and a guide for dummies. So Google that and have a look. Just really practical uh, ways forward. So I'm rather pleased about that. Dodgy photo, it's one of Sarah's and I've not scanned it high resolution enough, but it, again, uh, another fight with Vic Roads and so far so good. I called a highway, a double avenue. Uh, it's a mixture of species. It's still there and it hasn't been, <laughs> it's been bypassed in places. But uh, yeah, again, people are switched on now and uh, these battles are getting more lively. It's getting a lot harder for roads, uh, people to just slam dunk and knock it out. You probably know this, but there's TreeNet's address, which you may not have, treenet.org, or our address. And if you fiddle around on our website, you'll find um, advocacy and you'll find uh, our list. Have a look and let, let us know if there's stuff that's not there, if there's stuff that's wrong. There's more info we could put. Happy to hear about that. That'd be good. I've stolen photos and info of all of these people because this is not Stuart Reed's brain. This is all these other people's brains and hard work. And I'd like to say thanks to them. But I also hope that uh, that might have triggered a question or two. People are happy to unmute and uh, <laughs> we, can, we can talk a bit. Uh, yeah, that's probably it from me. Stuart, oh, Tim Gatehouse, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, hi, Tim. Oh, hi. Well, thanks for that. It's a wonderful talk. I was particularly interested and, and, and pleased you included the Avenue of Honour at Kudjawar. My grandfather's cousin, Claude Robinson, was killed at Vignacourt in France, and he would be one of the soldiers commemorated there. Right. I've been to his grave at Vignacourt. I even <laughs> pinched some uh, wild flowers from the grave, which were. Yeah. Um, and when you look at his parents' grave in the Kudjawar Cemetery, added to us is uh, their names and then and our dear son Claude who was buried at Vignacourt. So <laughs> very moving to me to see the, the avenues there. So thank you very much. Oh pleasure. That. Pleasure. It's a it's a beauty. I mean I'd love to see it a couple of weeks later in high autumn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In knockout. Thank you. No worries. And this is a lovely one too actually at Dalesford I forgot to mention the last picture. Yeah. There we go. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Very interesting. Good. Hmm. Make this a bit bigger. Thanks, Stuart. It was a great talk. Oh, good. Hi, Diane. Hi. Um, I just wanted to correct Paul. It is part of the ACT. Oh, is it? Big yeah. Part. Yeah. And it, it's a heritage precinct. Oh, I'm slighting it, is it? <laughs> Um, it was okay. very much a, its own village, yeah. but the um, the new town developments of uh, Gungalan, um, Belconnen, they're just squeezing it. So right. it, it has a, a fantastic tree planting around it. Right. Um, as soon as you go over the ridge, you see the new suburbs. Yeah, okay. 
Oh, it, is, it is oh, ACT. Oh, thank you. I'm probably mixing <laughs> it up with Murray Bateman and getting a bit rusty on Canberra geography. You better think, come and visit. Yeah, hello. I think uh, Bronwyn, my co-chair, has got secret designs on Gundaroo, so I'm hopeful that it's going to be something happening in Gundaroo sometime soon. Yeah, I don't know if you'd call it an avenue of honour. Um, uh, Anzac Parade leading up to the War Memorial. So yeah. even though it wasn't planted in the way the other memorials you've been talking about, it yep. is a memorial avenue. Absolutely. And well, it with was that, planted with that. in 1965. And isn't that, that's eucalyptus globulus, isn't it? Like, yeah. Yeah, and also New Zealand hebes in funny little planter boxes. Which, there, which like. just will not survive in that climate. No, well, as, as a Kiwi, I was a bit underwhelmed with how they looked <laughs> too. <laughs> I guess the intention was good. I, I, I think they're up to about version number 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to find a Kiwi plant that likes Australia. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Ah, joking, joking find the right kiwi plant. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Stuart. I'll say good night. Good night. <laughs> okay, Stuart, it's Robin here. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Pleasure. That Because uh, I wanted to hear the original and um, I'm really glad you've re done a replay for us. Ah. Um, Slight technical question. Uh, how many, what proportion are, have no heritage listing at all on them? A very high proportion. I would say in Victoria, there'd be, gosh, well, they're working on it in Victoria, put it that way. So, well, perhaps one of the Victorians can chip in for me here, but in New South Wales, I would say very, very few. You know, maybe yeah. there's some local heritage items. And that, I hope I'm wrong, but um, so there's, there's none, no... none on the state list. Yeah, I'll, turn, I'll turn on my video too, eh? Hey? <laughs> I, so, um, well, really, that was one of my intents. Was why aren't they yeah, at least yeah. local heritage items? They, they're all local heritage items. It's an absolute no-brainer. You know, yeah, exactly. I, I, can, I can just hear the council engineer saying, "Oh, what about the wires?" And I'm going to manage my roadside, my asset. But that's not the, that's not the, not the point, is it? <laughs> no, it certainly, it certainly isn't. But I was just, no. you know, wondering whether there was any sort of, um, you know. Um, beginnings of trying to get sort of a state level group listing? Well, Victoria certainly are doing that and I'm thrilled about that. And mm. um, I was also a bit tickled they rang me up and you know, to be on the sort of outside of the reference group or something. Yeah. So that was good. But have a look at the list on the AGHS website. Like where I can, I put in, you know, LEP item or I put in SHR yep. or usually VHR item. Yep. I'm just trying to think about Tasmania, but where we know it, it's on that list, mm. right? So mm. my memory's a bit fragmented tonight, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess no. that's that's the big five, ten year plan is why aren't these at right. least local items? And yes, that's got to be advertised yeah. and people have to agree, and blah, blah, blah. But get on with it, yeah. Australia. Like, you know, exactly. It's a bit of a exactly. no brainer. Yep. No, thank you. And, I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, I gave this talk in France, and that was, mm. I'd never been to France, and it was also, you know, that. 2018, it was the end of the First World War. And the nicest thing was driving down French country roads, which had avenues, which were all war avenues, mm -hmm. and going to a tiny little town called Le Folle Le Grand, which is near Verdun, and you know, going to the local Anzac Memorial moment with the mayor and three and a half locals and to the local hall afterward. Very super poignant, because it's not a big town, you know, yeah. and the same, same thing. And I bet, you know, that that's protected by French legislation. They have quite strict yep. legislation about trees. <laughs> yes. It's cultural, this thing. We, we've really got to catch up about plantings and about trees. Mm. Other people manage this. It's not impossible. And yes, there's a bit of management involved. Mm. Stuart, yeah. Stuart, Randwick Council at the moment is looking at heritage listing Anzac Parade. Woohoo! Um, mm. As a um, cult, perhaps as a cultural route. And we're okay. doing the, well. the work on that. So. Fantastic. So uh, I might need to talk to you sometime. Oh, please do. I mean, yesterday... <laughs> you really can't call it a memorial of tree. Oh, well, I don't no. know. Many things and many, um, many wars. Many. It's linked with so many associated sites. Everything from the hospitals to. I mean, yeah. they even set out for the Sudan from there. And more yes. Park and well, those all things. Complex. Yeah, those embarkation points are really or gathering points are quite important. Like. We've just put um, Rush Cutters Bay Park on the state register and, and Yarran Abbey Park. That was a deep departure point, you know, a gathering point for troops, volunteers, 
going to the Sudan war, whenever that was, and, <laughs> you know, because it's a Navy spot. So it's interesting, isn't it? These, just documenting these things, the social uh, value of these places, it's usually... Even the fact that the engineers were practising building pontoons or something in Centennial Park. Were oh, they? And, well, <laughs> like, yes. And it, but the, but what keeps coming up is that they use, they use Danzac Parade as a route for so many... Oh, just um, imagine. Yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a you know, gun post at the end of it, right? I mean, I was, we were interviewing an Aboriginal man yesterday about selling boomerangs and shellware at the end of the tram loop, which is Anzac mm. Avenue tram when yeah. it gets to LARPA. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. Why isn't it listed? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I'm glad you think that. <laughs> Sorry. Stuart, you, you said the National Trust in Victoria are yep. recording all of the avenues. In Victoria. Think, yeah. So yep. uh, do you think they'll do it in the other states, the National well, Trust? I think it's up to volunteers. And to be fair, I mean, Victoria has a very, what do you say, switched on bunch of volunteers, right? Particularly the tree mob. <laughs> I'm sure there are other subsets I'm doing a disservice to, but people like Greg Moore, who've been campaigning for years about urban trees or you know, lecturing in universities about the economic values and the health benefits of trees. So there's people like that who are running those committees or Burnley people and stuff. That's not to say it couldn't happen here. The National Trust of Victoria's Register of Significant Trees has gone national, like it certainly started in that state, but it now is aiming to go national. So really what that lacks is help in other states or, you know, other arms and legs really. To, to get photographs or <laughs> a recent, you know, what's that place looking like lately condition. It, it's down to volunteers at the end of the day. So if there's no one in New South Wales or no one in Queensland's put their hand up, you know, there's a gap on your map. So I, I would say get in touch, you know, or, or ask the National Trust here. I, they might be doing stuff here I'm not aware of. Yeah. Uh, but I certainly know it's happening first down there. Hmm. Um, Stuart, can I ask a question? Uh, Angela Brown, I'm in uh, Tamworth. Hi. And I just wondered if you're familiar with the uh, King George V Avenue here. Very, yeah. I was one Very of the bags that helped it get listed. Uh, good eye. I'm just curious. I'm um, a landscape designer and I'm just relatively new to the, the world of, um, you know, fighting for uh, significant trees and whatnot. Good. I'm cur curious about uh, the thinking involved not just with, with this particular example, but in general, when you have uh, a significant planting of trees and you have conflicting issues where you've got your um, developers on one hand, yep. uh, and plus the issues of the particular species, um, as you probably know, some of the trees on King George V are not in great shape. No. Uh, others are okay. I mean, just what kind of approach do you take when you walk into this kind of um, mess, you know, nostalgia on one side and pragmatism <laughs> on the other and Absolutely. it must be very hard to wade through sometimes. Yeah, look, it gets a bit heated and it's very hard to calm people down and, you know, even start talking calmly. <laughs> mm. uh, sometimes that might be a timing thing. And Braywood was interesting. It, um, the, the public kicked up so much stink that the council came on side and then New South Wales roads came round and they actually stopped what they were doing and started a ground up, bottom up rather than top down. You know, I'm a road engineer, get out of the way, I know what I'm doing. Kind of arrogance to let's have a workshop, let's talk about that, what does the community value, what does the community want, let's identify, let's hear people. Uh, and, and it took a couple of years longer, but they got a, a wide support for replanting and widening and, and road speeding up because some, <laughs> some of the locals wanted speeding, you know, no trees and faster. But it was consultative and bottom up, and that worked well. And, and in the end, they didn't um, the follow through didn't quite come to plan or timing. Even even using King George the Fifth, people may not know about this is an Avenue of Oaks outside Tamworth on the eastern side, put in for the King in the 30s uh, on a floodplain, and it used to be on the old highway. And the highway's been rerouted around it, so it's redundant as a road. And it's L-shaped; it's an odd shape, but. Um, the good thing is that I try to think who paid. I think probably council paid most of it. We paid a wee bit. They did a management plan and got in some outsiders, uh, including Andrew Morton, terrific horticulturist, arborist, two hats, one guy, you know, and, and some landscape architects and, you know, actually unpacked it, talked to the same thing, talked to the community, talked to the farmers, talked to the power line people, <laughs> 
you know, all the players, but actually came up with a plan. Said, well, we've got to replant this sometime. And how do we do that? How do we do that in a, in a, a slow speed or in a segmented way that the community can live with? Or we pick off the worst trees first. You know, these ones have got two years left of life or mm. those ones have been carked in 10. You know, how do we stage this so actually it starts looking a bit loved and cared for, uh, but it might take 10 years to redo. Uh, and again, I think implementation is a different thing to doing the planning, right? So I'm, I'm out of date on what's happened there, but um, I think you have to be a bit consultative. You have to slow down. <laughs> That's really hard for road engineers because often they're lining their ducks up funding-wise and governments-wise for years to get to point X, and they just want to get on and finish the project. They don't understand that there's any anyone else <laughs> <laughs> involved and that's true of you know any single issue group and that's true of community groups they just want to save every tree even if it's rotten and it's got five percent of cambium left and you know it will be dead in five years in the first decent storm they mm. don't necessarily understand tree um, horticulture and, and tree growth so there's a bit of education on all sides needed but that's that's quite a skill set you know you actually need to be like a marriage guidance counselor at Burton. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like the person who yells loudest to win, ultimately. Uh, well, often that happens, unfortunately. And mm. Yeah, it's interesting how the Tamworth people, they were very clever. And they used um, people like Troy Cassadaly, you know, sort of people, no, known people, got on magazine covers with adorable children, <laughs> had, you know, picnics, on, very clever to try and, what do you say, make community attract, uh, affection visible. Hmm. And that's not visible on the council meeting on the night, but you know, here it is on the front page of the paper for weeks. Um, very clever. Hmm. I mean, often doing it behind closed doors and quietly is more effective, but yes. I don't know. Yes. Each council is different. Each situation is a bit different. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. Good question. Have you got a uh, National Trust listing on those trees? Which ones? The ones we were just talking about, Tamworth. Oh, oh, Tamworth. Well, they're on the state register. They're on the state register. Yeah, I'm happy to say. Look it up. It's called King George V Memorial Oak Avenue or something like that. Yeah. It, I think it's locally and state listed. And, and pleasingly, there's a management plan. So that's nice to be able to point to. <laughs> I mean, it's also helpfully got wires going down one side and you know, pressures for... <laughs> rural residential you know just imagine all of that but uh, at least people know about it now right so the stories are written down and you know things will be done a little more slowly and a little more carefully i hope well thank you Stuart. pleasure wonderful thanks thank you thank you Stuart. check out the list online <laughs> <laughs> thank you Stuart. terrific talk I love the illustrations. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. Pleasure. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> and where's hey, Stuart. Steve, Steve, Steve went very well. Organised that very well. I think it was a great yeah. success, Steve. Yeah, it was. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for everyone for joining. Yeah. Bye -bye. Good night. Good yeah. night. And we don't have to drive home. <laughs> yes, but not at all. <laughs> no parking. No. <laughs> no road tolls or anything. No washing up. <laughs> no. <laughs> and the dog enjoyed it too. <laughs> <laughs> I put the cat to sleep. I didn't think I bonded with the cat anyway. 